Aaron Blanchfield just got 50-45 and served some humble pie. It looks like her wrestling wasn't so great after all. I got the main event right, and a lot of people got it wrong. And listen, all I got to say is this. We are going to break down every single fight on tonight's fight night. And I just wanted to give myself a nice pat on the back. Listen, I know we didn't really care that much for Aaron Blanchfield and Fiora, but a lot of people were saying... You know, a lot of hardcore fans were saying that this is a real one. This is, this is actually a WMMA fight that's for real hardcore fans. And I thought it was a good pick. I went with Menon Fiorat. She smoked Aaron Blanchfield. Let's just get into this fight right off the bat. The timestamps are in the description, by the way. The reason I picked Menon Fiorat is because she's in better shape. She's stronger. She's faster. And she has the long range striking. And Aaron Blanchfield's kind of like a Teletubby, if you ask me. She's... Small for the division. She's not lean. She's not that in shape. She's not super strong. And Fjordrot's shredded. She's fast. And she was stuffing takedowns against Rose Namajunas. And I know that we look at Blanchfield like she's a high-level grappler. And yeah, she competed in jiu-jitsu. And she subbed some people in jiu-jitsu. And she submitted Molly Can. <laughs> Molly McCann, the can. Okay? But... She didn't really do shit to Tyler Santos, so she's not the WMMA version of Habib. And Fjallrat is big, strong, shredded, who actually has really good striking, who also has good takedown defense. And we saw what happened. Aaron Blanchfield's sloppy one-twos, crashing forward after losing her confidence when she got her takedown stuffed, just didn't pay off. And it's not like Fjallrat even looked that good. She still looked kind of sloppy, but she was faster. She had some really nice counters on the back foot. 50-45, and Aaron Blanchfield gets some humble pie. She was talking a lot of smack lately. Not really that much. I mean, she's not really dissing people that often, but Aaron Blanchfield, she likes to talk. She likes to get catty. Either way, good performance from Men on Fiorat. I get the main event right, and now let's get on to the co-main event because this is the one that really stung me. This was an abomination, is what this was. Vicente Luque literally quit against Joaquin Buckley. There's no other way to put it, okay? I picked Vicente Luque. I feel like you had to go with Vicente Luque, knowing Joaquin Buckley's career. He's never beat anyone close to Vicente's level. Vicente, even though he's not necessarily a top five guy, he's always been holding it down in the top 15. I know he had a brain hemorrhage and he had an issue after the Jeff Neal fight, but his chin looked okay against RDA. To be fair, RDA kind of just gifted him that fight on the silver platter when he was failing takedown after takedown after takedown. But let's not sit here and act like Joaquin Buckley really took the fight to Luque and beat his ass and got a finish. Buckley was imposing his will. Buckley was on the front foot. He was the more active guy. Vicente Luque came out like his usual plotty self, slow as fuck. I mean, I had the comment on it while watching it. I was like, this guy looks so slow. Holy crap. But... That's kind of normal for him, right? It was the second round that was really strange. Buckley was kind of doing what he was doing in the first round. Vicente was starting to land some more kicks to the body. And Vicente shoots a takedown. Buckley stuffs it. And before Buckley even lands a single strike, like a pitter-pat strike on the guard of the elbows of Vicente Luque, Vicente's already shelling up in the fetal position, quitting. And that was it. So it's not that Buckley's nasty shots, ground and pound shots, got Vicente Luque rocked and out of there. No, Vicente Luque was shelling up after he got his takedown stuffed and just decided to wilt and quit and give up. And I don't know what the hell that was about, but it was a disgrace. And I'm happy that that wasn't the main event in hindsight because that would have been a really anticlimactic main event. And for Buckley... It would have been nice to see him get the win in a different fashion. Yes, he was doing well early on, and he was winning the fight, and Vicente Luque seemed to be mentally checked out, but he's always a bit of a slow-looking guy, and he kind of builds into the fight sometimes. But we just didn't see him actually try to get this win or try to fight through adversity. This was the opposite of the usual, you know, hard-nosed, granite chin, super tough Vicente Luque that's willing to fight through adversity and take a lot of punishment he basically just gave us uh walking buckley a free win christmas came early for walking buckley got a nice little christmas gift and i don't even think he would necessarily get ranked if it wasn't for a vicente luque just wilting in front of him and 
giving him that once in a lifetime opportunity to have the easiest win ever. So listen, it is what it is. Good stuff for Buckley. He's finally ranked. Okay. But I don't think he's going to hold on to that ranking spot for a while. And for Vicente, I think he should think about retirement after that. He might not be there mentally anymore because that was a really bad look for him. On to the next one, Chris Weidman versus Bruno Silva, okay? Truly an anticlimactic finish as well. Now, it's great that Chris Weidman looked good in this fight, and I'm happy that he didn't just get blown out of the water and destroyed and have his legs kicked to pieces like it happened last time, right? But listen, this was anticlimactic. Let's not make any mistake about it. I know it wasn't ruled a KO, but it basically was Chris Weidman given the win because he just eye poked Bruno Silva. And I literally saw the finger of Chris Weidman poking out of the back of Bruno Silva's skull. That's how bad the eye poke was. Okay. Listen, you could say, well, you know, they ruled it a unanimous decision and whatnot. And Weidman was winning and Weidman was winning the fight, but there was still two and a half minutes left on the clock. Anything can happen in a fight. I don't think it's necessarily good enough to just say, all right, well, let's give Weidman the benefit of the doubt. Bruno Silva got dropped with an eye poke. It wasn't a shot that was following the eye poke or a shot that came before it that put him down. Chris Weidman sent a finger through the eye of Bruno Silva, which immediately forced him to go down and shell up. And the ref basically stepped in immediately after that. So the finish, it wasn't clean. I completely understand why Bruno Silva was so pissed off after that. But Weidman was winning the fight and he was looking good. His jab was looking crisp. He wasn't really able to get the wrestling going early, although he did kind of stink up the end of the first round with that wrestling. But the second round was a scrap. They were slugging in the second. Weidman rocked Bruno Silva, almost had him out of there. I think he clipped him with like a head kick as well. So he did really well in the second. But then there were two eye pokes in the third. The second one basically led to Weidman just getting his hand raised in general because, of course, like they didn't just want to resume the fight. And I wish they would just resume those fights. I wish they would look at a replay, determine that actually it was a blatant foul, a horrible eye poke, and let's let this guy continue if he wants to. Either way, maybe it shouldn't be scored a unanimous decision. I know that's not going to be the popular take just because Weidman is a fan favorite and we're all happy that he won, and I'm happy that Weidman won. I saw him hugging his family after, and it's good that he feels like a winner tonight. Absolutely. But you cannot deny that it was a very fishy sequence, all right? I don't think I've ever seen someone go down that quickly due to an eye poke. It was a nasty one. It was the worst eye poke on the card. And the next fight that we have to go over, again, shout out to Chris Weidman. I'm really happy that he got the win, but it was a bit anticlimactic. And even though he was probably on his way to winning anyway, we got to just call it how we see it, all right? Ruzi Boyev versus Cedricus Dumas. Ruzi Boyev, I picked him to win this fight by a KO or a submission in the first, and he got it done by KO, but another anticlimactic finish where this guy, Ruzi Boyev, with a ton of hype surrounding his name, didn't look that great in this fight. He kind of only had like a nice right hand and that was it, but it's not like Cedricus Dumas was doing anything. But then in the middle of the round, Ruzi Boyev, I poked Cedricus Dumas, not nearly as bad as the eye poke that Chris Weidman landed on Bruno Silva, but still grazed him with an eye poke. Zedrikas Dumas turns his back to Ruzi Boyev, looks at the ref and says, hey, I just got eye poke, like, stop the fucking fight. The ref doesn't answer, doesn't listen to him at all. He's still just covering his eye, not trying to defend himself. And, hey, Ruzi Boyev smashes him with a freaking nasty uppercut and knocks his ass out. So, you can't blame Ruzi Boyev just like you can't blame Chris Weidman, but still... This was different than the Weidman finish because at least Ruzi Boyev landed a nice uppercut to send Cedricus Dumas falling, but Cedricus Dumas took himself out of the fight voluntarily, and that's why it's anticlimactic. It's basically Ruzi Boyev fighting someone that's just literally not fighting him at all. It's like a sucker punch. Literally was a sucker punch TKO. Again, it's not a sucker punch in the sense that Ruzi Boyev did something that was wrong, but it's the effect that you would get when sucker punching someone that doesn't expect it. Now, for Cedricus Dumas, that might show a low fight IQ. I know me and my chat were talking about how Marty Lewis back in the day when he would get eye poked, he was always going through a defensive frenzy because he never wanted to alert the ref to let the ref know 
that there was a sign of weakness. There was a shank in the armor. And Marty Lewis would go in a defensive frenzy. Maybe Cedricus Dumas should have gone in a defensive frenzy. That's not the best instincts in a fight. Again, you can't just bank on the referee to stop it. You always have to protect yourself. Maybe he should have went like this, but backed up and kept his other eye on him. But for Ruzi Boyev, of course, you're just going to keep fighting until the ref pulls you off anyway. Or until the ref gets a timeout. So we got the nice finish, but still a little bit anticlimactic. Again, he didn't even look that great early on in the fight, even though it only played out over the course of a couple of minutes. But he basically knocked someone out that was blind and not even looking at him and literally just stopped fighting him. So just not that impressive. Dude, the last three fights outside of the main event, Luke A. Buckley, that's Buckley knocking out a guy that's just taking a nap and just deciding that he doesn't care about being a fighter anymore. Chris Weidman getting an eye poke TKO. It wasn't even like a, a, an average eye poke TKO where someone gets eye poked and then they get hit with follow-up shots. No, he literally just sent him flying with an eye poke. And then of course, the Ruzi Boyev eye poke moment where he just knocks someone out that's blind, basically. Very anticlimactic moments. Bill Aljo, Kyle Nelson, another controversial anticlimactic finish. Holy shit. Bill Aljo got stopped early on the feet by Kyle Nelson. It was a close fight. It ended in the first round. It looked like Kyle Nelson was in charge. He looked to be the more powerful guy. But of course, Bill Aljo usually builds into his fights with volume and starts to break his opponents and get to their gas tank and whatnot. So we didn't really see how it would have played out in the second and third. But essentially, Bill Aljo gets rocked in the first round badly. Fair enough. He was rocked. He was out on his feet. But then, a couple of seconds later, even while Kyle Nelson is teeing off on him up against the fence, you could see in his eyes that he comes back too, and he's like fully there again, and he recovers really quickly. It actually shocked me at how quickly he was able to recover, despite getting put under a ton of pressure and getting hit with a flurry while trying to recover from getting rocked. So I'm like, all right, shit, dude, that's great recovery. We know he's tough now, all right? Like, I'm, I would never expect him to get stopped if he just gets rocked one more time, given that we just saw him recover very quickly on the feet. A couple of seconds later, Kyle Nelson rocks him again. But this time, again, Bill Aljo's on his feet. He's still standing. The ref just steps in and says, no more fight, no more fight. What the fuck? What are you doing? You're stopping this man when he was on the feet. He's not even on the ground. He's not even been knocked down. It's the first fucking round. I've seen people take tremendous beatings in the first. I've seen people get dropped like multiple times in a fight in the first round and they come back to win. But one punch that just stuns Bill Aljo and he's just stopped. Again, like the referee shouldn't be thinking about the first exchange in which he got rocked. It's the first round. He hasn't even taken that much punishment. This is not Gagey versus Ferguson, where Aljo's been getting his ass whooped for, what, 14 minutes, and he's gotten rocked 50 times, he's just had no ability to have any success. Okay, fine, the next time he gets rocked, stop the fight, but that wasn't this. So let's get on to the next one, Chidi Nijakwani versus Reese McKee. Chidi did not look that good in this fight either, and listen, he won 30-27, I picked him to win by KO, I thought he was going to look a lot better. Reese McKee is not that good. He's got no sting on his shots. He's not fast. He's not particularly skilled. And I thought he won the first round. And I also thought he came close to winning the second round. But of course, he got out damaged even though he had all the control time. My issue with Chidi Nijikwani in this fight was that there are glimpses where he looks so good with the clinch striking, with his elbows, with his knees. Right, We see like these moments where he looks phenomenal. He's fast, his technique is on point, he's cracking these guys hard, but he just kind of spends most of the fight pittering around, pitter-patting around with low kicks, like doing a whole lot of nothing. I think this guy could be a lot more dangerous if he just kind of imposes himself a little bit more, marches people down, gets them into the clinch, and then kind of fights out of that first and, and puts a little bit more pressure on people. I know his issue in his last fight against Bakal Oluksaychuk is that he emptied the gas tank too early, but I think he kind of went to the other extreme and was way too patient, and he still won, but he didn't really start looking decent until the third round. So I didn't think it was a great looking performance from him, but he still gets it done, so there's that. Nate Landwehr, Jamal Emmers. This was actually a really good definitive TKO. Typical Nate Landwehr, 
getting rocked early, but having that dog in him, coming back, beating up Jamal Embers in the clinch, landing good knees, landing good shots in on close range in the Diddy boxing range, and eventually he catches Embers with a nasty uppercut and a big meaty hook to follow it up on the equilibrium of Jamal Embers and smashes him with some overhands, or I should say uh, hammer fists. Really Nate Landwer-esque win, just showcasing that he's super tough, he can get back into a fight. Jamal Embers looked good early on, and in the beginning of this fight, I was a little worried because Jamal Emmers stung Nate Landwer and dropped him early on in this fight and was dominating the opening minutes. But Landwer just landed a nasty combination in the clinch, sent Jamal Emmers flying, knocked his ass out with the follow-up shots as well. Very definitive, great stoppage. Emmers was out on the ground, and I'm really happy to see Nate the Train get another win. He gave a really good high energy speech on the mic like we always get from Nate the Train. So I'm happy to see him get that win as well. I'd like to see him get a nice bump up in competition. Put him up against another guy with a pretty big personality in this division. Who would that even be? Featherweight doesn't really have a lot of fighters with personalities, to be honest. It's like Volk, Taporia, Max. Who else? Mitchell? There's that. Maybe him and Mitchell. I can't believe I forgot about him. Yeah, put him up against Mitchell. That'd be a great fight. I'd love to see that. Let's get on to the next one. Julio Arce, Herbert Burns, like clockwork. Herbert Burns quits in the second round. This was almost like the Luque fight. It's just, it was a standing TKO moment where Julio Arce, I think he like clipped Herbert Burns with some, no, I, wait, and I think it was like a fucking takedown or something. First of all, it wasn't a punch. Herbert Burns was never rocked. Not once, okay? Not once was he rocked before he started shelling up. Herbert Burns just simply shelled up for nothing up against the fence. I think it was like a grazing punch to the forearm of Herbert Burns that made him shell up and cower away in fear. And because he was just sitting there not doing anything, not fighting back, eventually Julio Arce on his like 11th or 12th follow-up strike to the guy that's quitting landed a nice flush shot and put him down. But uh, Herbert Burns, again, no heart. He's the 10 man of the UFC. And uh, just a disgraceful showing from him. This is the third time he's quit in a row. I don't understand what's up with this guy. I don't even know why he likes fighting. He's clearly not got his heart in it. So yeah, horrible performance from him. On to the next one though. Connor Matthews, Bazooka Joe. Bazooka Joe's not so mid anymore, okay? And to be fair, I think that uh, I may have overhyped or overrated Connor Matthews, but he looked really good in all of his before UFC fights. Like he was smoking guys in the first round, knocking dudes out, dropping people, subbing them in the first. He was a finisher and he looked fast, but against Bazooka Joe, he looked like dog shit. Okay. Like he was throwing these leg kicks and these teeps that looked like they were in slow-mo. I mean, he was putting absolutely nothing on these shots. He was throwing his hands in slow-mo. The only strike that Connor Matthews was throwing with any effort whatsoever or anything on it was an overhand once in a while, and that was it. This was not the guy that I was watching during my tape study, and Bazooka Joe knocked his ass out, okay? Knocked his ass out, and I was happy to see him get the finish because Connor Matthews just did not deserve to win this fight looking that bad and that slow on the feet. And to be fair, I've been saying Bazooka Joe is a little bit mid. He did take a short notice fight against Sean Woodson, and that guy has a very weird build, and he's super hard to take down. It's just a hard guy to hit in general. So it's not the worst look in the world. Again, it was short notice, and he got smoked by Jamal Emmers early, but he didn't really show a lot of himself in that fight either. So he looked all right, still didn't look that good. Um... But he imposed his will when Connor Matthews just kind of sat there and accepted defeat in this fight and thought he could win with a little lazy teep to the body. But yeah, good win for Bazooka Joe. On to the next one. The Pleasure Man loses to Ebo Aslan. They were slugging. This was a really fun fight. In the second round, it really started to heat up. They were literally just trading in the pocket. Eyes closed, slugging big meaty hooks left and right. And Anton Turcali just doesn't have a lot of pop in his hands. Whenever these guys would land shots on each other, it always looked like Ibo Asland actually was able to get an effect from Anton Turcali and he was able to get respect. It was usually Turcali that was starting the exchanges, landing a couple of punches, and he would get caught on the exit 
And every time he would get caught, you would see, wait a second, like Ebo's got some serious thud behind these shots. And uh, in the third round, that was the story. Ebo Aslan catches Anton Turkali with a big hook over the top, like an overhand or something, puts his ass out. Well, to be honest, he didn't knock him out, uh, but he did send him flying to the canvas. And the ref stepped in. Turkali was out of it. You could see his eyes glazed over. He was not ready to take the onslaught following that big punch. And that's it for Anton Turkali. The pleasure man's done. People were saying in the build-up to this fight, you know, it's so unfortunate that, that Turkali has fought the cream of the crop, man. And Vitor Petrino's good. And Jilton Almeida's a beast. Tyson Pedro's not that great, though. But they were saying he's not really gotten a chance to show how much of a monster he is. Well, he literally beat Ibo Aslan before the UFC. But I just looked at the trajectory of him, the lack of power. There's nothing that he does that's that great. His boxing is kind of trash, but hey, it's even a worse look because Ibo Aslan's boxing is even worse. So I just don't think he has it. He doesn't have pop in his hands. He's not that fast. He's not that technically sound with anything that he does. I think he's going to get cut from the UFC. Unfortunate, but that's how the game goes. Not everyone is going to cut it in the UFC. And we may have just seen the end of Anton Turkali's career, even though he's only 27. For Ibo Aslan, though, he looks like a fun fighter. Not that great either, but he's durable and he has heavy hands. Let's get on to the next one. Another strange moment. Jacob Malkoon and Andre Petrosky ends in a hip TKO. Jacob Malkoon knocked out Andre Petrosky with the impact of his hip while Andre Petrovsky shot in with a takedown. And uh, yeah, that was it. And Jacob Alcoon followed up with a freaking soccer kick that came down from the heavens. So it was a very strange finish. I didn't even know why Petrovsky went down. I thought I missed it. I just saw Andre Petrovsky miss a takedown and all of a sudden he's on the canvas like shelling up for dear life. But yeah, it was the hip. Jacob Alcoon's Teletubby hip. He doesn't really look to have bony hips. That's a weird thing that happened. But Malkoon was kind of getting the better of him in the early going of that fight. He got rocked in the first round, but that always happens to Malkoon. He has a suspect chin. He tends to get rocked early, but he usually does a good job of building into fights. But he did kind of look to be the more technical guy when it came to the boxing. He had a crisper jab. He had better boxing, whereas Andre Petrosky was just throwing big meaty arm punches and just kind of like shoving himself into Malkoon and like overextending and missing big and he did land one big shot and he got a takedown at the end of the round but just expended a lot of energy i think it was a matter of time before jacob malkoon just started to take over the fight anyway but hey andre petrovsky's chin is so bad he gets tko'd with a little bit of a hip impact so it's very unfortunate and uh kowlin lagren versus pakeko gets the win as well i picked kowlin lagren He's like the Irish Drew Dober. There's like three Drew Dober archetypes in the UFC. There's like Martin Prado or Francisco Prado, I think his name is. There's Kowlin Lagren and there's Drew Dober. So another Drew Dober prototype bursts onto the scene with a granite chin with nasty power in his hands and he gets it done. I picked him to win this fight. I think I went eight and four on the card overall. I got the main event right. I got most of my picks right, so we did pretty all right in general. Not the most entertaining card. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Until next time.